Well, to review what we've talked about in chapter three so far, we've talked about what it means for a function to be continuous at a point, and then we defined a continuous function to be a function that is continuous at every point in its domain. We talked about the algebra of continuous functions, and we talked about uniformly continuous functions, and we defined some terms like closed set, open set, and compact set. Well, now for the last section in chapter three, we're gonna talk about properties of continuous functions. And the first theorem we're gonna look at is very simple. It says that if F, mapping the domain into the real numbers, domain being capital D, if it is uniformly continuous, and if D is bounded, then F of D is bounded. And remember what this means. If you take F of D, where D is the domain, Another word for that is the image of the function f, or the range of the function f. It's all the values that get mapped to in R. Well, first let's make sure we, we're, we're sh sure what we're talking about. Let's look at an example that would fail because it's not uniformly continuous. If we took the function f of x equals 1 over x, well, we, we know what the graph of that looks like. One, one is one of the points on the graph. And I'm just gonna look at it from the perspective of positive values of x. It also would be graphed down here for negative values of x. <clears throat> but if I look at this from, say, zero to one. Zero to one is clearly a bounded set. D is bounded. But f of d is not bounded, as you can see when x approaches 0 from the right-hand side, f of x is blowing up to infinity. Therefore, this function is not uniformly continuous. We've already shown that this, in particular, function is not uniformly continuous. So we can't remove this word uniformly, or unif, as I abbreviated it. Can't, abbre can't remove that from the statement of the theorem. <clears throat> okay, let's go ahead and, and prove this. For the proof, I'm going to start off by, well, since I know it's uniformly continuous and D is bounded, I know it's uniformly continuous. I'm going to start off by saying let's just choose any value, any positive number for epsilon. I'm going to choose one for convenience, but it would literally work for any positive number. Since f is uniformly continuous, there exists a delta greater than zero such that x minus y less than delta implies f of x minus f of y is less than delta, which is for us one. So this distance would be less than one, the distance between these two values. I left off the part where x and y both have to be in the domain here um, in order for this to be true. Otherwise, f of x or f of y wouldn't, wouldn't exist. All right, well, since d is bounded, There exist some particular numbers in the domain such that the entire domain is contained in the union of a bunch of delta intervals around each one of these. Okay, so I'm going to say delta 1, or x1 minus delta to x1 plus delta, unioned with, and take that union all the way up to xn minus delta, xn plus delta. <clears throat> 
maybe I could have abbreviated that a little bit. This right here, I could have said that's the union of all of the xi minus delta to xi plus delta as i goes from 1 to n. So let's make sure we understand why that's true. D is a bounded set, so it has a lower bound and an upper bound. So there is some number, maybe little m, there's some number, maybe capital M, where the domain D is completely contained inside that interval. All we're doing here is defining an x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6. They don't have to be evenly spaced in here because it's possible that, that D is not this entire interval. It could be an interval here, and maybe an interval here, and an interval here. So it doesn't have to be evenly spaced like I made it. But the smaller delta was chosen to be, the closer I would make these values to each other. So in this case, I made, let's just say that I made them delta apart. So the first interval here would be x1 plus or minus delta. So that means that that width is delta. So because d is bounded, we can define this set of points. One more time, if if delta were a very small number, then I would have put x1, x2, x3, and I might have needed 50 points, or 100 points, or 1,000 points. So that's why we're able to make that statement. Uh, let me, before I erase this, notice what x2 plus or minus delta would be. It would be that interval. So they're overlapping, which is fine, but the set D is going to be completely contained in that union of those intervals. All right, well, let's see what that means. Notice that for every x in the domain, for every x in the domain, it's going to, the x will fall into one of these intervals. It could fall in more than one of them because they overlap, but that's fine. For every x in the domain, x is an element of xi minus delta to xi plus delta for some value of i. So for some i in the set 1 to n. And, maybe I'll, and for each x in some particular interval, remember every x is in one of the intervals, this means that f of x minus f of xi is less than epsilon, which is 1. So x, every single x in the domain is in one of these intervals, and it is, it, it is within distance 1 of our chosen x sub i. Well, let's, let me write down what this means. I'm going to need a couple of lines, so I'm going to go to the right. This <clears throat> says that the distance from f of x to f of x i is less, strictly less than 1. I could write that like f of x being strictly in between f of x i plus 1 and f of x i minus 1. That means the same thing f of x has to be within 1 of x, f of xi. And I, another way of saying that would be that f of x is contained in the interval from f of x 
i minus 1 to f of x i plus 1. So I kind of went overboard in showing these three statements are equivalent. Three different ways of saying the same thing. Well, we only have n of these points. We only have n of these intervals. That's a finite number. We can take a maximum and a minimum. So what I'm going to define is, let's let capital M be the maximum of not the fxi's, f of x1, f of x2, up to f of xn, but f of xi plus 1. So like the maximum of these numbers for each of the n intervals. So I will I'll write that like f of x1 plus 1 and f of x2 plus 1, f of x3 plus 1, all the way up to f of xn plus 1. And I'm going to define, I'll use little m to be the minimum of the lower bound of the intervals. f of xi minus 1. So f of x1 minus 1, all the way up to f of xn minus 1. By doing that, let M, capital M, be the max, let M be the min, and we see that F of X is less than or equal to capital M, greater than or equal to little m for all X in the domain and therefore f of d is bounded. And that's the end of the proof.